effect and and let's see and um give us time and my team to meet you and so that hasn't hasn't been happening but we have a little bit of a break in our agenda today for some questions and answer periods for anything that comes up today and then also a time for you all to if there's questions that you want to pose to the field or questions that you want to ask of us and our team so just um, keep that in mind. It's towards the end of the two hours if there's anything that you're kind of itching to ask. Um, and our presenters from today will stick around. So let's get started. Kwong, can you pull up my slides, please? Um, I want to encourage people to um, feel free to type any questions into the chat. We'll be monitoring. We do have breaks through the presentations today. Um, and we do have periods where um, we can stop and answer questions. So please type into the chat. Um, let's see, next slide, Pong. So just to, to lighten the mood as we start, um, as people are still coming in, changing their names, um, if you want to throw in what your favorite candy is into the chat, um, we, you, you might not have been around our team too much, but we all love candy. <laughs> and everyone has their favorite candy. So if you want to spend a minute, just throw in your candy. And we'd love to see what, what's out there. And maybe you can help remind me and can go out and get some. Oh my gosh, I love it all. Um, we are recording the meeting today. The recording um, is for people who are not able to attend today to be able to have access um, to the information that's shared. And we will post the presentation to our website and we will send out um, the information to everyone once it's posted. So this, any slides that are shared today will also be available to you. seems really early for candy, but I still love candy. <laughs> um, thanks for putting that in. Next slide, Kwong. So this is our agenda, um, our state program office. So um, if you see in some of the staff's, um, our staff's uh, name, you'll see SPO, and that's the state program office for some of you who might not have seen that before. So. Um, the School Based Health Center State Program Office will be giving some updates. Um, the updates are very much focused on some of the funding opportunities that came out from legislation. A lot of the date, we have a little bit of a data update from Loretta, um, but a lot of the information that might be specifically certification related with details, dates, um, we try to send those out so you all have that on record. And if you miss this meeting, there's um, no pressure that you missed something that was said. So, um, but we wanna give some space to some of the, the new and exciting funding opportunities out there. Um, we have someone um, from the Healthcare Provider Incentive Program that's gonna be talking today, short break. Immunization program is here um, with some, Great um, information about COVID and then really um, here to answer any questions and then Oregon School Based Health Alliance. And then, as I said, we have a, an open Q&A session period. So the, the presenters from earlier will stick around for any questions. This is an opportunity, again, for you all to ask questions of each other in the field and also any of our team in our program. Next slide. So let's... Uh, figure out who's in the room. Since we can't, can't be in shared space, um, we have a couple polls to give us a sense of, of uh, the people that we're, we're meeting with today. So um, is this your first coordinators meeting and, and what's your role? So Kong, will you launch my polls, please? Okay. Is this your first school-based health center coordinators meeting? And if you could share with us what your role is.
And then Kwan, can you share some results? So we have a bunch of new people. Welcome. <laughs> Sorry, we can't be together and meet you in person. Um, and then we have a lot of familiar faces, which is really great too. Um, it's nice to see. We have a variety of people's roles in the room. And as most of you know, um, coordinators for school-based health centers are essentially identified by the system. So um, whoever the system or the, the, the medical sponsors assign as their coordinators, we also um, invite, if you want to invite staff, primary, your, your providers, and we invite um, our mental health providers and our mental health partners um, to the meeting too. So, great, thank you. Next slide. Okay, some of our updates. Um, as I said earlier, so adolescent and school health um, is kind of the overarching umbrella of the work that we do um, and school-based health center program sits within adolescent and school health. And we've had a lot of growth in adolescent and school health in the last year or two and we're still um, growing. And some of this is some new legislation that we'll talk about. But I wanted to share with everyone to let the field know, to let you all know what's, what we do and, and our links and connections with other programs beyond school-based health centers. So if you're doing work in any of these fields or these areas that um, you might hear from other staff that we work with, or if you're interested in anything else, we could connect you and make those connections. So as I said, we house the School-Based Health Center program. We also are currently running um, a school nurse pilot program, and we have a school nurse, school nurse consultant on our team. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the School Health Service Planning Grants. It came out of the House Bill 2591. We have a youth sexual health program. We do some policy and assessment work. Um, and as many of you know, uh, we support and our team supports a lot of the student health survey data, which was previously the Oregon Healthy Teen Survey. The House Bill 2591 also is, um, there's funding that came out for mobile and telehealth programming. And then we have received some funding for some COVID school-based recovery work. So a lot of this work um, overlaps with school-based health centers and just want you to be aware of what's housed in our, in our unit. Next slide, Kwong. Um, so our team structure has changed a little bit with all the growth and I wanted to um, show you our little org chart because we love org charts. Um, and if you look at it, I've highlighted the staff that you probably are familiar with that represent the school-based health center program. Um, and we have a couple new people that are, are not exactly new to some of you um, that are returning to the program. So uh, Melanie, who is on today, Melanie Potter is our school health program specialist and she will be supporting um, the school health services planning grants and technical assistance and support to the field. Um, Kate O'Donnell will be returning to the program as the school-based health center health systems team lead. Um, she starts in November, November 1st. So many of you are probably very familiar with Kate. Um, she was in the role in um, temporarily helping us out during my trans transition. And Kate will be returning into that position permanently. So we're really excited. Yay, I miss Kate too. <laughs> so excited. Um, so our team is, is um, building out and, and some of you also may recognize Melanie's name. She used to be with the program um, as admin support. And so very familiar with school-based health center and the model. Um, and obviously Kate's been with the program and, and so excited to have people returning and building out our team and support for everyone. Next slide, okay. So as promised, um, I'm gonna dive into some of the funding opportunities that came out of House Bill 2591. So um, last session, uh, 2591 passed in the, the long session and that bill includes three essential programs, um, funding for three essential programs. Um, so there are grants for school health service planning grants. 
Those are 10 grants to school districts or ESDs for needs assessment activities to support either a school nursing model or a school-based health center model. There are, there's funding for mobile school-linked health centers. Um, that's up to three grants for school districts, similarly, or ESDs to support planning and operations um, for a mobile health center. And then the telehealth pilot project is three grants to certified school-based health centers to participate in a pilot project. And I'll go into a little more detail for each of these. Next slide, Fong. Oh, Melanie's gonna go into some detail. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Rosalind. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so as Rosalind was saying, um, through uh, House Bill 2591, we'll have school health services planning grants for up to 10 new grantees, like last biennium um, grantees will go through a phase one doing a needs assessment and phase two, they'll choose to either move forward with um, opening an SBHC or pursuing the school nursing model. Each grantee is eligible for up to $90,000 for the entire biennium grant period. And we are super close to getting the, the request for grant proposals out, really hoping, honestly, within the next couple of days. Um, and uh, proposals will be due in mid-December. It says tentatively, but I don't see that date changing. So right now it's December 17th. And just a, just a reminder, proposals need to be submitted technically by a school district or um, ESD, but we definitely encourage folks to collaborate with their schools um, to partner on sub submitting proposals. Um, also, we're gonna be hosting two information calls, and I believe these are for all of the HB um, 2591 funding opportunities. Um, I don't anticipate these dates will be changing either. Um, the first one is next Wednesday, the 27th from 9.30 to 10, and the second one is Thursday, November 18th from 1 to 1.30, and the call-in information, will be hosting those on Teams, and the call-in information will be available in the um, request for grant proposal documents. Thanks. Okay, a little bit about the mobile school linked health center. So the funding um, states that we will put out grants for three school districts or ESC to implement a mobile school linked health center um, for the biennium. Um, and the legislation currently reads that they must provide primary care services, they can provide other services, um, and they must be on or near school grounds, and you have licensed or certified healthcare providers that are, that are part of the model. Um, the funds can be used for planning, technical assistance, or operations. So, um, and the funds are up to $90,000 per grantee, and uh, roughly the funding period would be, or the grant period would be January to June. Um, anyone who's done a mobile probably recognizes that $90,000 is not very much money and to buy a mobile unit. And so I do think there's probably a sense that you would have to either have available or other funding in order to be able to support the purchase of a mobile clinic. Um, but the idea is during this funding period that you would, you would not, you could, you could use this time period to be planning and providing assistance to build on an existing model. Um, there's a lot of flexibility in, in what um, this funding can be used on. Um, it, the proposals do, again, have to come from the school district or the ASD. Um, there is no, nothing in the legislation that actually requires any sort of link or connection to a school-based health center. Um, so the, it can be outside of the school-based health center system. Um, but I want everyone to just be aware that this is a funding opportunity that's out there. Um, how we are, how, so um, in the next couple of days, when the funding for the school health service planning grant is released, we will similarly have information about the mobile school linked model. We are doing a request for interest. So we're just asking districts and school and ESDs to submit a letter of interest, not do a full proposal first. And then we will release the request um, to those who submit a letter of interest. 
And the reason for that is mostly because we have no sense of how many people in districts would apply to this funding opportunity. And so I, and to take some of the work burden off of big long requests to proposals, as some of you know, there's a lot of work that sometimes goes into that. Um, and so if we can first get an assessment of an interest, um, submit some information, then we can determine how much um, we need to make it competitive and what information we would need for the request for um, grant proposals. So see, I saw you had a question. Do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, I just, uh, I think it was answered, uh, I, I, I think. Uh, so you guys are outreaching the schools, right? So the, how, how are we making the schools uh, aware yeah, it's these months. Okay, great, great question. So we will be releasing one email, both proposals out um, through the Department of Ed. So that's one path is that our Department of Ed partners will blast it out to all the school districts. So administrators, superintendent lists. So that'll get out to hopefully the education partners in a, in a very um, systematic way. We obviously will send it to the school-based health center community. So you all please share with your partners if you think someone's interested. And then um, our school nursing listserv and partners will also receive it. So that's another uh, school health tie-in. So, and then, you know, I imagine um, it will get filtered out in some ways, but it will go through the Department of Ed. So every school district and ESD should see it in a organized fashion. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. Oh, this is what I was saying. So the request for letter of interest, um, we're hoping to release it with the the other um, school health services planning grants. And again, the request has to come from school districts and, and ESDs. Next slide, Kong. Okay. Um, the school link pilot program. So hopefully some of you have seen the email that has gone out already to the coordinators list and administrators list for um, letters of interest for the telehealth pilot program. So these are grants, three grants to school-based health centers to operate a pilot project um, to expand access to uh, mental and physical health care services through telehealth. Um, the way the legislation reads is that the certified school-based health center must be the distance site that where the provider is that is providing the telehealth and working in conjunction with a school nurse located at the originating site. Um, it's, it doesn't um, require that the school nurse have to be the telepresenter necessarily. So the person that is sitting with the student or the patient um, I think that is part of the pilot that we'd like to explore, but the legislation does require there is some school nursing capacity located at the originating site and the originating site is where the student is located. The funds are um, can be used for staffing. There is something written into the legislation that requires um, some funds go to the district to support increased school nurse capacity and school-based health center staff capacity. It can be used on buying technical equipment, technical assistance, and the awards are up to $300,000 per grantee for that funding period. So the remainder of the, the biennium. Um, next slide. So there is, as a pilot, there is an evaluation process um, that um, is required in order for us to advance the program or learn from the program. And per legislation, these are the components that are called out. So at minimum, these would be areas that we would be focused on for the pilot. So billing practices and reimbursement, access to healthcare services, um, impact to student absenteeism, and then workflow. And then as we've been discussing internally, these are some of the areas of interest that we would probably additionally be wanting to look at. So how are we going to capture the clinical encounter data um, on the telehealth side? What's the intersection of HIPAA and FERPA? Um, are there services that fit in a telehealth model that are beyond primary care and mental health that might work? Who can be a telepresenter? Um, and how do we really build in partnerships that provide culturally specific services if we have this ability to expand our access? 
side one. So similar to the mobile, we will be releasing a, or we have um, asked for a request of letters of interest. So this is a little dated because it went out, yay. Um, and we're asking you to respond with a letter of interest and then we will set up interviews. So in that way, it's a little different is that we're not doing a full um, grant proposal because this is a pilot project. And so we're asking for letters of interest, a little bit of information in that letter of interest. And then we will be following up with interviews of those people, of everyone that actually expressed the letter of interest to determine kind of readiness um, and to figure out what you're thinking that you wanted to do with the telehealth pilot. So it gives us a little bit of um, a sense of what people are thinking and that they want to do, but also how much can we support them in the goals of what the pilot is supposed to be intended for and then what you as school-based health centers are interested in doing. And then I'm going to turn it over to Wes for the last one. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Wes Rivers. I am the school-based health recovery strategist for the unit um, uh, leading our COVID-19 recovery program. Um, so uh, last week, we released uh, a request for proposals that was informed by experiences from the field as we've talked with you all since uh, March 2020, as well as um, uh, a round of key informant interviews. I think everybody on the call who participated in that, that was really helpful in uh, formulating the funding requests. Um, what we received uh, funding from the, uh, the Centers for Disease Control uh, to provide funding directly to uh, school serving entities uh, for workforce capacity. So increasing workforce capacity as it relates to COVID-19 recovery. Um, how that's going to look for the field is where re we released uh, a request for proposals for uh, $1.5 million uh, to increase uh, workforce capacity in school-based health centers. Um, there will also be opportunities for districts uh, with respect to school nursing, as well as uh, for uh, community-based, non-SBHC community-based organizations who are operating in schools in another capacity. Um, but that is real. that funding is really to support uh, new staff additional hours, training, uh, anything that would support the workforce to provide uh, more services. Uh, the CDC is extremely flexible in what those, pro uh, those professional types are. Um, we're putting a huge emphasis on uh, really um, uh, providing living wages for unlicensed staff. So you'll see that in the uh, proposal, uh, the request for proposal. Um, uh, and also increasing the capacity of culturally and linguistically specific staff. Um, the max award for, per SBHC medical sponsor is $150,000, and the funding will run roughly from January 1st, 2022 to July 2023. Um, we the applications are due on the 19th of November. Uh, and as part of the announcement that went out last week, uh, we provided uh, 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 an evaluation criteria that uh, our state program office will be using to uh, prioritize proposals. So we'll give you a sense of uh, what we're looking for. And I think that's it, Rosalyn. Great. So um, I a couple things is um, the funding for all of the funding opportunities except for the COVID, so the school health service planning grants, the mobile clinics, and the telehealth clinics are built into the budget. So there's an assumption that given if we were to be flat funded, continuing into the next legislative session and on, that that funding is part of our budget. So it is not necessarily one-time funding. So those are continuous funding opportunities. And as the models, the, the school health service planning grants, um, if anyone's been part of a planning process before, um, you know that the idea is that you, you come into the funding formula and that funding supports you coming into the funding formula. Um, and for the mobile and the telehealth, I think we, particularly the telehealth pilot, I think we would figure out um, the first two years and, and the first, whether the funding would need to be adjusted going into the next two years and what the pilot would be showing and, and bringing. So 
Um, the COVID money is a one, a, essentially a one-time funding opportunity. So that funding, as Wes said, um, ends June 30th, 2023. It is a CDC um, grant, and there is no intention at this point of that money going beyond that, that timeline. So I have this slide. Um, I appreciate everyone's patience, um, and we have a very slow contract process happening. Um, so before I open it up to questions on any of the funding opportunities, I just want people to um, hear and out of full transparency is, is that our, con our contracts office is very busy and really focusing on getting out COVID related contracts. Um, and therefore many other contracts are being, um, there is a slowdown and a holdup. And so um, some of the school-based health center contracts for this biennium are still in progress. I know we're getting some of the signatures back, which I really appreciate. Um, but as this new funding rolls out, the contracting process could take a little bit longer than it's been even in the past, which has been a long process. And um, we will try to move the funding out as quickly as possible and really support um, sites to be as flexible, I mean, for us to be as flexible as we can in supporting the sites to do what work needs to be done. Um, but again, I think the goal is because the COVID money is um, limited that, and because it's COVID related, that that is probably less of a slowdown than some of our school-based health center related contracts, which are not seen as a priority as much of getting out as quickly as some of the COVID recovery funds. Questions. You can feel free to write um, questions into the chat or just speak up. I can't see everyone. Um, so feel free to just unmute yourself and ask any questions. I have a question, Rosalind, uh, and and I I don't know uh, if this the right question for this group, but uh, the way that this uh, um, funding is going out in, in relations to 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 the school districts and you know what format they want to do, do they want to engage uh, a school nurse or that they would look into a school based health center? What would they want to do? And um, I, my experience has been that uh, schools are constantly uh, uh, changing, right? I mean, uh, particularly in our area, we have change in superintendents, principals, and you know, huge amount. So, what one decided that it is one thing, the other may, you know, uh, yep. otherwise. And, and, and we have a new superintendent. And I think uh, in one of our major schools that we have several of our school based health centers. And um, it seems to, to me in, in talking to other people as well, that it, the, the culture is, we just, what do we have to do to check the box? So sometimes there isn't a whole lot of uh, a thought beyond that. And so I, I am wondering if um, if it's left to 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 that, if if it will be easier for some to say just get a school nurse, we'll check the box that we need to make sure that she's doing all the COVID stuff that we need to check check check, and um, we're compliant with ODE and you know uh, and the needs, and, and leaves me to 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 mourn a little bit of what it could have been, right? What it could have been to um, provide the uh, more of the, the help with the social determinants of health, yep. with the medical visits, with our behavioral health clinic therapy and, and so forth. So um, I guess this is not a question as much as it is, uh, I'm just throwing it out there that I, I can see that developing into that situation. Yes, I, um, I really appreciate that comment. And I think we, even prior to COVID, in a planning process, we knew that 
school administrative turnover is impacts very much the planning ability for you all partners to be able to support the processes. And we've had those experiences even prior to COVID. And so I, I totally get that. And I appreciate your comment. I think um, I will hold that. And I think Melanie, who's leading the school health service planning grants, and as we do some of these other ones, I think we can try to build in some hopefully checkpoints where it's not just checking the box and that there's partner engagement and that what that looks like and, and what and trying to figure out how decisions are made and, and those pieces. But I, I hear what you're saying, Ceci, and I appreciate um, the feedback. It's hard for the school. It's been hard I, for all the schools, right? Yeah. The whole thing. So whatever is easier for them to move things along, that's that's what I talk about, the check the box thing. Yeah. Because there's there is that temptation. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. And it's hard for I'd say, you know, it's all it's a this funding has been very challenging even for us to figure out how to get the funding out because as you know, we are tasked with getting this funding out, right? We have this funding available and the legislation requires that it show up in a certain way, yet we yeah. know everyone is tapped out. And so how do we make sure that we are creating opportunities for people who are able to take the opportunities, but at the same time um, support ones that maybe not this minute could do it, but maybe be in a space somewhere else. So all these things um, keep swirling through our heads. Um, I just wanna clarify that the telehealth bill actually come, can, comes from a school-based health center. So the telehealth grants and the COVID recovery grants are school-based health centers specific. We need school-based health centers to respond to those. So it's, and I think um, Loretta, there- Sorry, no, yeah. No, 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 that's right. I just, I just wanna clarify that. So yeah. the, the mobile and the school health service planning grants are the district DSD grants. Mobile. The telehealth okay. and the COVID are the school-based health center specific ones. Um, oh, it's confusing. It's, it's confusing. <laughs> I know we're a little bit past time. So what I'm gonna do is um, let Loretta do a quick data reminder move us along, if we can come back to some of the comments in the question period. Um, so Loretta, maybe you can try to help me track those chats. And yeah. then when we get to the Q&A period, we can circle back to the questions. Yeah, yep, Great. for sure. So um, next what slide, Fong. All right, hi everybody. I'm Loretta, one of the research analysts on the um, School-Based Health Center team. You probably see emails from me about all things related to data satisfaction surveys and counter data, KPMs, operational profiles. So here is yet another time where I'm talking about dates and deadlines. Um, so we pushed out the operational profile updates to December 1st. Typically those are due October 1st, trying to, um, I mean, we know what everybody's going through and it's a crazy time. Um, so sites must go into the operational profile and update all of the tabs in the database. Um, I'm not going to read through all of these things because I would just be reading um, these bullet points. Um, it's standard things that have to be updated every year. Um, before um, the pandemic, I would do a 90 minute operational profile training webinar, um, but find everybody finding time to do that, it's not ideal. So I'm actually gonna do a couple of short videos based on the topic area of the operational profile updates um, for new folks in particular um, to go in and watch those videos. And again, I'm gonna make them short so you don't have to watch a really long presentation. Um, I have yet to record those, but my plan is for them to be posted on our website early November. Obviously, I'll, we'll send out an email announcement about that. Um, we do have a new operational profile manual posted on our website. Um, it's on, posted several places um, on the website, including the data requirements page, um, certification tab, um, and that will also be sent out. I've got a abbreviated operational profile manual just for financial entries as well, since not always the coordinators fill that out. Um, so those will be going out and always feel free to reach out to our program if you have any questions through our SBHC program email or directly to me. So I talked really fast. If you have questions, um, you can ask them later in the um, longer question period. 
Okay, Kwong, I'm done. Or feel free to enter them into the chat and yeah. we can also um, respond in the chat box. Um, I am gonna turn it over to Joe Sullivan. Are you there, Joe? I can't see anyone, so I'm <laughs> just hoping you're there. Um, <laughs> yes, I am. Yay, welcome. <laughs> um, I'll turn it over to you. All right, perfect. Um, thank you guys so much for giving me a few minutes of your time today. I know that um, it looks like we're a little bit behind schedule. I might be able to cut a couple minutes off of my presentation to help out with that. Um, but I'll try not to rush anything so that you guys get all of kind of the pertinent information here. So first and foremost, my name is Joe Sullivan. I'm the healthcare provider incentives coordinator inside the clinical supports integration and workforce unit. Um, it's a new unit in the Oregon Health Authority, which includes the primary care office, as well as the patient-centered primary care home um, teams. Uh, next slide, please. And so just a little bit of information about the healthcare provider incentive program. Can hit the next slide. So um, the healthcare provider incentive program as a kind of a quick summation of what it is, is it was initiated in 2017 by the Oregon legislature. It combines several disparate plans happening at different locations underneath one umbrella at the Oregon Health Authority and created the um, healthcare provider incentive fund. It is overseen by the Oregon Health Policy Board and directed by the policy board um, and consists of five primary incentive buckets that are aimed at increasing the supply and retention of the healthcare workforce in targeted communities. Um, primarily the incentive that we will be discussing today as it relates um, to folks who might be employed at your guys' locations is loan repayment. Um, and we have a budget of $6.7 million for the 2021 and 23 biennium, um, which is dedicated to providing loan repayment uh, to folks in the healthcare workforce. Um, Next slide. So um, primary care loan repayment incentive. What it is, is an exchange of a service obligation for a percentage of someone's student loan debt. Essentially what we can do is pay up to 50% of someone's student loan debt, not to exceed $150,000 in exchange for a three year service commitment working in a rural community or other communities experiencing inequities. Um, the qualified sites and loans are all determined by OAR. Most of the things are pretty um, descriptive and laid out in rule and statute, um, but SBHCs um, are qualifying sites within the program. So as administ or as coordinators, as folks who are helping kind of administer the healthcare provider incentive program, I think one of the um, primary things for you all to keep in mind is that in order for anyone to apply for a loan repayment, the site has to have an individual site application on file with the Oregon Office of Rural Health. Once that site application is on file and you've received an email saying that your site is eligible, folks working at that site are then able to apply as a part of the program. If someone were to apply prior to that site application being on file and active, they would get, they would get a kickback um, saying that they need to get the site application on file first. I see that a question came up in the, um, in the chat and I'll kind of roll it back a little bit, I guess, for the um, folks who aren't too familiar with this program. So the Healthcare Provider Incentive Fund and Program is strictly state funded. It is created or it was created in 2017 to support and augment some of the work that's being done by the National Health Service Corps. So the National Health Service Corps is a federal loan repayment program that has similar requirements and similar um, capabilities in, in aimed at supporting the healthcare workforce. The problem with the National Health Service Corps is that it's federally based. Oregon has made a lot of investments into our healthcare and when compared to, against communities across the country, we don't necessarily have high, high enough scores to get and actually receive that federal funding. So HIPSA scores typically range, or don't typically, they range from a zero to a 26. And what the feds will do is they'll take their say $500 million in a year and they'll just start it. Everybody who applied with a 26 and give awards until they run out of money. Typically prior to the influx of cash that happened in 2020 as a result of COVID um, relief funds and this new administration, putting extra money into the healthcare workforce, 
anybody that was at a HIPSA below a 17 was likely to not be awarded through the federal program. We have been told um, that that number is likely to go down since there's more funding, but we haven't seen the data to show us kind of where that HIPSA score um, actually lies. So in response to folks having need in Oregon, but not necessarily rising to the level of need on a national scale, the Oregon legislator created this fund to support needs in Oregon. Um, folks cannot, I appreciate that uh, clarification, Rosalind. Sometimes I'm so involved in this work that I'll use acronyms, so feel free to call me out if I uh, speak to anything that's um, you know, too vague or that's, that's an acronym that people aren't familiar with. Um, so the National Health Service Corps is gonna target the highest level folks throughout the state and they'll be able to get awards. And then what we're, what we're really doing is targeting people that are in kind of that second area or folks that carry larger amounts of student loan debt because the National Health Service Corps only provides $50,000 of student loan debt. Um, for those of you that work in areas or clinics that are competitive for the National Health Service Corps, I will say that providers who carry less then $100,000 in student loan debt will benefit more from the federal program because their service obligation is only two years and it is not based upon a percentage of their student loan debt. So if someone had $100,000 or let's say $80,000, I would only give them 40 for three years where if they had 80 and they went to the National Health Service Corps, they would get the same 50 and it would only be for two years because they don't have a consideration of what your student loan debt actually is. Um, I saw a question below about participating in two programs. The rules for both programs, federal and state, are that you cannot be engaging in two service commitments at the same time, which means that you cannot participate in um, the National Health Service Corps at the same time that you're participating in a state program. I do want to clarify that the kind of caveat to that is that providers are allowed to participate in PSLF, so the public service loan forgiveness, um, which is the 120 consecutive or qualifying payments and they'll um, forgive the rest of the student loans. Um, that is allowed to happen because there is no service obligation tied to that. And if someone doesn't complete, someone doesn't complete their 10 years, um, they will not be required to pay back any funds. So that's kind of the differentiation there. We want to make sure that nobody else is participating in an agreement where they have funds to repay if they don't fulfill a certain service obligation. Um, we accept applications every day of the year. So anytime that you guys wanted to turn in a site application, anytime that a clinician wanted to turn in an application, they would be able to submit it. What we do is we have rolling quarterly cycles. So if one closes tomorrow, a provider who turned in an application tomorrow would just be considered in what we would look at as the next cycle. So folks will start on quarterly start dates of 1-1, 4-1, 7-1, 10-1. So there's really going to be kind of like a no wrong door. If someone comes to us and turns in an application, we're not going to say, you didn't make it in this cycle, wait till next year. We're just going to take that process, the application, and consider it for if it was Four one, for example, we would just then say, okay, now you're in the seven one um, start date batch. You can go on to the next slide because I think it'll um, answer a little bit of the uh, kind of questions that I see coming up in the chat, and that's about kind of the parameters and requirements around participation in the program. So this is some of these things are new changes. Um, some of them are kind of slight tweaks to the program as it used to exist. So in the past, we had 40 hours required work weeks for staff that is no longer on the table. And we're just assuring that someone has 32 hours of direct patient care, which involves you know service hours as well as charting case notes and things like that. What we're not counting as direct patient care hours for the purpose of this program is really administration. If you're doing any sort of supervision, if you're, um, you know, taken away from your role and it's, uh, it's far removed from the direct patient care kind of aspect of work. And that's for folks to participate full-time. We also have a part-time option where if someone works 16 hours, they could get um, an award that's up to 25% of their student loan debt, not to exceed the $75,000. So it's really just the full-time gives the uh, 150 and then the part-time could give the 75 depending on someone's student loan debt. Um, 
we uh, I think I mentioned all of these. I will say that the kind of bottom bullet is probably important as well, that these are competitive award cycles. I do want to say that only about 45% of those who apply are able to get awards in the cycle they apply for. That being said, if people actually stick it, stick it out with the program and apply more than once, it's not very common that we let people fall completely through the cracks. Um, those who show their dedication um, to to the workforce, to wanting to actually get their loans repaid and kind of if they keep coming back to us over three quarters, uh, that typically kind of indicates to us someone's commitment to the to the community and to the site. So we try not to let people who, who have that true dedication um, slip through the cracks. Now, if you go ahead to the next slide, I think it might saw another question come up that this might answer. Um, it must be my last slide. Um, can you go to maybe advance it? One of these might be a poor order to discuss it in light of the questions. Next, uh, there we go. Okay, uh, I think this is gonna answer a couple of the questions right here. So in the past, folks at school-based health centers that had breaks during the summers were not able to participate in the program. Essentially what they would say is you're not in the clinic for 45 weeks of the year, um, we're not able to make an exception for school-based health center um, staff. That has since changed. Um, the National Health Service Corps has a mechanism where essentially what they'll do is an amend a contract for a however long break during the summer um, and then add that on to the end of the service obligation. So providers who were awarded and work at a school-based health center um, would have breaks during their actual break, but that time would be added on to the end of their service obligation. So if it was a full quarter each summer, um, those three quarters would be added on to the end and their service obligation, while it might look like on contracting paperwork is for three years and nine months, is three years of actually um, direct service that's um, being required just like any other professional, just kind of uh, making those adjustments to support uh, that need. Um, one other important thing is that providers are now allowed to provide service offsite. Um, if people are providing telehealth services, if they're working remotely, if say they have to meet someone in a community, if, um, you know, I don't know exactly how the um, makeup of every site looks, but if anybody has to leave the brick and mortar in the past, those hours would not have counted. Um, we have made the adjustments to support people kind of meeting the needs of the community, meeting people where they're at and being able to be responsive of the actual needs of the folks who you guys are providing care to. One of the other main constraints that we removed, as I mentioned earlier, was the requirement for the 40 hour work week. Um, we had that with the caveat of the 32 hours of direct patient care. We removed the 40 hour work week because what we really care about is the 32 hours of direct patient care. Um, and one other thing that has been unclear in the past and that I just want to make sure that I illuminate is that SBHCs in urban areas experiencing inequities are now certifiable as sites. We have HIPAA ex um, exceptions that could be granted um, due to the population served. So if you're in an area that has a high needs population that you're a specific um, cultural, ethnic, uh, language need population that's being served at your site, we can make exceptions to not being in a health professional shortage um, area based on that need. Um, so all applications are still going to go through the Oregon Office of Rural Health. And I like to make this call out just so folks understand, clinicians will likely ask if they're not in an, a rural area, I'm not gonna be able to get awarded, I'm not rural. And that is strictly because they process applications, they administer the program, for the state because that's who our contractual agreement is with, not because we only have an investment in rurality. Um, could you go back one more slide? Um, so I will say I saw a couple of questions. I will provide you guys with handouts as well as links to the program information. I think I'll just send it to you, Micah, if that's okay, and then you can route it um, through to everybody so that you have the direct link as well as um, a one sheet that gives information about the various incentives that are available. Um, one thing that I do want to call out, because I know that you guys have uh, behavioral health staff um, at some of your different um, SBHCs and how that staffing has looked has probably, you know, probably changes from site to site. And um, I know in the past has prevented some folks from being able to participate in our programs and um, the SBHCs 
advocates have told me that we needed some adjustments to the program to be able to support. So that's kind of in light of that was what we responded with the changes that I just shared. And then also through advocacy of the behavioral health um, in the behavioral health realm, we have developed a new behavioral health loan repayment program um, that hasn't existed in any way, shape or form previously. What this did is it expanded the program to support folks who are not licensed or who are pre-licensed and that can um, qualify as QMHAs, QMHPs. And then we also are included inpatient, day treatment, community-based and hospital settings. All of these providers have historically um, faced barriers or um, rules that parameters that were keeping them out of participation in this program um, that have since been taken away. What we're really trying to do is create an opportunity for those who have the ability to provide care, to provide care and participate in these programs, get the financial relief from their student loans to have the stability to maintain um, their profession if that's what they choose, or to get some help paying their loans if they would like to continue along a career pipeline and maybe decide to go get their master's or licensure down the road. Um, this is really aimed at targeting. Um, uh, yeah, so I see a question down in the chat. Federal loan repayment does not cover QMHAs. No, it does not. And it does not even cover QMHPs who are working towards licensure. So the federal program is strictly for those who have a license in hand. And we're able to support folks kind of on that pathway. Um, really what this is aimed at is um, diversifying the workforce, creating a pathway and pipeline and opportunity for folks that are representative of rural communities, um, communities of color who speak a second, second language to actually be able to provide the care that they want to provide. And then, um, you know, really create those opportunities uh, for fu future education if that's um, what people choose and what people would like to do. Um, so, so far we've had two application cycles for this behavioral health loan repayment program. And I will say that this program is even more competitive than the traditional loan repayment program. Um, we've awarded, now we had one more cycle since I created this PowerPoint a couple of days ago, and now it's um, at 67 behavioral health professionals that we've awarded for just over $2 million. Um, we have had an unprecedented number of applicants in each of these cycles. Um, so I would encourage particularly behavioral health staff um, to get their applications in kind of early and as soon as possible so that, you know, the more people that kind of find out and the more promoting we do about a new incentive, kind of the larger that the cycles will hopefully get down the road. So the earlier they get in, maybe the, the, the less competitive um, things will be. All of that kind of said in light of the fact that I don't know how familiar everyone on this call is with the different policy changes that have happened or the bills that have passed, but legislature in the last session passed House Bill 2949, which is a sweeping behavioral health workforce bill. Um, it provides over $80 million in, in um, incentives for be behavioral health professionals. And the plan is for this loan repayment program to transition into being a part of the behavioral health workforce initiative. Um, and that loan repayment will be taken over by them at some point and that there will be a larger pool of funds available for folks providing these behavioral health services. Um, <clears throat> the, da, 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 da. When is the next app deadline for this quarter? Let me go look it up. Real quick. Just happened. Um, yeah, and the one of the, I appreciate you actually making that call out declining funding. So the National Health Service Corps only notifies folks once a year that they're actually selected for an award. Um, so folks who apply for two awards will typically not know until September um, whether or not they actually got selected by the National Health Service Corps. Um, so it is really important for folks who apply to both to make sure that they communicate to the National Health Service Corps that they do want to cancel um, their application or decline an award if they get offered one. I had a clinician the other day call me one day after she was supposed to disperse it and the feds will not be flexible like I will be. She got a $50,000 award asked to not have the contract one day into it and they said that she would owe over $150,000. 
um, back to them. So the federal government is strictly running this program to make sure that people are, I, I don't want to use the word trapped, but that they have to uh, fulfill the whole contractor face substantial financial penalties. Um, we have substantial financial penalties in contract as a possibility for us, but we have never um, instituted them as we are, you know, we're looking to provide um, an adequate workforce, helping support the workforce and give people the ability to provide care free of the stress of ridiculously large uh, student loan debt amounts. So um, that is not the intent of the program. The intent of the program is to keep people working in Oregon and give them the ability to kind of perform at the top of their um, scope. So this cycle ends on December 2nd. So that's when the window is going to close. And that's actually for folks with a 4-1 start date. So what we'll do is we'll close on December 2nd. And over the next couple months, we'll hold the awards meetings and all of that after we process all the applications and get folks scored and then notify folks um, about 45 to 50 days ahead of 4-1 to let them know that they've been awarded. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if somebody can't get an application in by 12-2, if they turned it in on 12-3, all that would happen is they would be considered for a 7-1 start date and put in that um, cycle with the other clinicians who apply at that time. Uh, let's see if I have any other. Oh, thank you for sharing that film, Mike. I appreciate it. And um, so, yeah, I just want to make sure that everyone on this call understands that there is a commitment from the program and me as the manager of the program to support school-based health centers. We recognize in the past the program hasn't always done the best job of doing that and we're dedicated to continue to kind of tailor the program to support the needs of all Oregonians and understand that the school-based health centers play a really big part of that. So if there's any sort of barriers, um, any sort of things that you guys see that would keep maybe your particular site from participating that might look a little bit different for you, please do reach out to me and we can have a conversation about what services look like, about how the site might look or what kind of things we can do to fit you within um, kind of the, the boxes and the parameters of the program so that your uh, clinicians can participate. Even more so, um, those of you who are at risk of losing clinicians, because we understand that, you know, there's a lot of turnover. Um, you can do directed outreach to me if you have folks who are applying and you know that, you know, the opportunity to get student loan repayment is kind of a make and break thing for them staying at your site. Um, I'm more than happy to kind of have that conversation with you and have that flag raised for me so we can keep that eye um, on them as we as we work through the cycles. So obviously, we can't guarantee that um, anyone gets awarded, but it's a. Um, you know, it is an okay thing to do if you would like to advocate for any of your individuals. Um, so a couple more things in the chat. I think that's kind of the breadth of the information that I'll give. Um, what I'll do to get all the information out is I have a hand, a, a bunch of handouts that I typically would take on a site visit. I'll go ahead and give that to Micah and he can disperse the information um, as they see fit. Um, probably just reach out to Micah and, or do you just want to send it on your own or do you want them to reach out to you? Yeah, if you send it to me, I'll send it out when we okay. send out materials, the other materials attached to this. this okay, perfect. Thank so, you so much. What you'll get is a one sheet for traditional loan repayment, a one sheet for the behavioral health loan repayment in case you know different types of providers want a copy, as well as I'll send a matrix that actually compares the federal programs to the state programs and provides links, award information, all of that on one piece of paper as well. Um, and then uh, some links to the program so that you all can get things moving if you feel like it'd be beneficial. And Micah, I know that you had planned for me to join in a little bit here for the question session um is that still the yeah if you're it, um first i just want to say joe thank you so much i mean i feel like we 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 you are a true advocate for school-based health center so i i appreciate that um and um yes we have a question and answer session if you're able to hop back on at that point and you can respond um that would be great and then people can continue to chat some questions that might pertain to this program or even um, unmute themselves and ask you directly if you're able to do that 
Yeah, and if anybody has any um, has any questions that they want to take offline to, my email is at the end of this PowerPoint. I'm happy to take calls individually, kind of answer emails or questions um, as is needed. What time is the question? I'm gonna I'm gonna pop off and then I'll make sure that I'm back for the question and answer session. Well, I got us delayed to start with. Um... <laughs> on the agenda it says 10 40. <laughs> okay perfect i will pop in just like a few minutes before then and i'll just hang out on the call if, if, okay. you, if you're not already Thanks. starting the question thank you joe all right see you guys in a few thank yep. you okay so we're um it's time for a break so let's take a five minute break um give people a break so we're a little behind but that's okay we have we have some buffer room so we'll come back at 10 10. thanks everyone
Okay. We're having some people slowly come back. Hopefully, anyone really wants to hear Rex talk. I think I saw you, Rex. Are you there? I am here. Yay. Okay. Well, I'm going to think that people are probably itching to hear your presentation, so they'll want to be back. And why don't we go ahead and get started? I'll turn it over to you, Rex. Sure. Thank you very much, Rosalind. Get my video on so you can all see my face, hopefully. So I am Rex Larson. I'm the Quality and Surveillance Manager with the Organ Immunization Program. And I have, I think, presented at the annual school-based health center meeting many times in the past. Um, but I realized I think I missed last year because of COVID. Um, we we didn't we didn't have a we didn't have the same blowout meetings like we always <laughs> typically do. So I I thought it was just me that missed it, but I think the whole world missed last year. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of what I have to talk about today is also COVID. So I, I know that it's a topic everyone's heard a lot about. Um, and I'll help to throw in some non-COVID things, but. That's going to be a big part of what I talked about. Next slide. So I'm going to give just kind of a brief update on where we are statewide with COVID vaccination. I'm going to talk a bit about the pending approval for COVID vaccines for ages 5 to 12, and then hopefully talk about the impact of COVID-19 on routine immunizations. And then I have kind of two questions I'd like um, all the school-based health center coordinators to ponder as well. And then you guys will have some time to ask me questions. Next slide. So to start just with a COVID-19 vaccination update, I'm sure many of you know this, um, you know, vaccinations in Oregon have really plateaued. So we're not nearly at the speed of vaccination we were in the spring. 65% or so of the state has been vaccinated and that's all ages. And we have seen a significant uptick. Um, it doesn't look that significant on this chart, but the rate of vaccination did increase a fair bit with Delta. Next slide. So I think that we saw a lot of people start to realize um, that, you know, the, the hot vac summer had been canceled and that there was still a lot of work left to do. In particular, uh, younger ages saw an increase in vaccination uptake with sort of the media coverage around Delta. So you can see that the 12 to 17 year old age group, which I know is a really key group for school-based health centers, did see some uptake over the summer. Um, that group right now is about 62.1% vaccinated. So it's, it's not um, exceptionally high, but it is pretty high given the, the, that those kids are sort of back in school now and that we have more opportunity to reach them now than we did over the summer when, when we saw that uptake. And so I guess just as we start talking about the 5 to 12 vaccination rollout and um, particularly vaccination in these other groups that are served by school-based health centers, I'd like all of you to kind of think about how you're, what you're doing for COVID vaccination in your school-based health center, what, um, what ability you have to participate in COVID vaccination with the school district or with the local public health authority, and what plans you're making to sort of communicate with students and parents as well. Next slide. So I think just to launch into pediatric planning, just to kind of give, um, an introduction into really what is gonna be the next couple of months for the immunization program, and probably the next couple of months for the, the focus of the state in many ways. As you all know, there's a vaccine on the horizon, Pfizer vaccine for five to 12 year olds being licensed. To give you an idea of the scope of it, just to kind of do an overview of by the numbers, we have about 330,000 five to 12 year olds in Oregon. It's about 1.2% of the population nationally. And CDC is allocating initially about 120,000 doses of vaccine to Oregon. Um, it's, it's a pretty large number. If you all remember how constrained COVID-19 vaccination supply was back in January, February, and March, this is definitely not going to be the same situation that we had then. And the rollout is gonna look pretty different this time as well. So back then we did not have very many vaccination providers that were really ready to provide COVID vaccine. Now we have more than a thousand providers that are expected to vaccinate five to 12 year olds in Oregon. 
So that means we're going to have a lot less mass vaccination activity, a lot more primary care vaccination. 75% um, of Oregon school-based health centers are enrolled as COVID-19 providers. And so hopefully we'll have a lot of school-based health centers that vaccinate as well. The, we know though that we will be in sort of a, a moderately constrained supply situation for a while. So obviously nobody is going to get enough vaccine right off the bat to vaccinate all of their children that want it. I think um, kind of the double-edged sword, good news and bad news is that um, not everybody intends to vaccinate their children right away. So um, even amongst people who got the vaccine, um, people still have a lot of questions. There's a lot of opportunity to educate and communicate about childhood vaccinations. A Kaiser Family Foundation poll of parents of five to 11 year olds found that about a third of folks wanted to vaccinate their children right away. About a third were wait and see. And then about a third was only if required or definitely not. So there's a lot of education opportunity and hopefully school-based health centers can play a role in that as well. We know that uh, communicating with parents of five to 11 year olds is definitely something that um, school districts and school-based health centers do quite often. And um, we're gonna have to do a lot of work, um, probably not you know, in the next month as we'll be focused on vaccinating those kids who are in that vaccinate their child right away um, group, but probably in the coming months, there'll be a lot of education and communication. Next slide. So where are we in the vaccine approval process? Um, there are a lot of steps in approving any vaccine. So obviously Pfizer completed their pediatric trials and they submitted data to the FDA. And so the next step is that the FDA has an advisory committee, an independent advisory committee um, called VRBAC. That is the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee. They review that evidence and they make a recommendation FDA reviews the evidence and the recommendation, and then FDA makes a recommendation to the federal government about licensure. In this case, it would be an emergency use authorization. So even though the Pfizer vaccine is authorized, um, is fully authorized, this is a, a new drug code and it's a new age group. And so this would be an emergency use authorization for this initial group. And then they pass it to the CDC, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. They review and they make a recommendation and then the CDC director makes a final federal recommendation. So it's sort of a four-step process for those federal committees. That gets passed on to our local sort of Western state scientific review work group. That group typically just reviews to ensure that um, all the appropriate checks have happened and then they can make local recommendations as well. And they pass that on to the governor and the governor will make a final decision and that will get passed to the Oregon Health System to implement. Next slide. So where are we actually in the timeline on that? Uh, we are about to get into that process. So at this point, Pfizer has already submitted their trial data and there is a Verback meeting to discuss um, that particular issue on the 26th already scheduled. So we would probably expect the FDA emergency use authorization to come within a few days of that meeting. Sometimes it happens as early as the evening of that meeting. Um, in this case, probably there'll be a little bit more time to review the full trial data. So by the 29th or so, um, we are actually in the process of pre-booking and placing orders right now. So doses are expected to begin to arrive on November 1st. And so just before probably vaccinators will begin vaccinating. The Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices meeting is going to be the second or the third. And we would expect that CDC recommendation to come pretty closely after that. And the Western States Scientific Safety Review Work Group is probably going to issue a recommendation by the third or the fourth. And so we would really expect sort of the window for when we start vaccinating in Oregon to be sometime between November 3rd and 7th. It really just depends how quickly things move through that federal process. Um, and that means that sort of the next two weeks are really key planning time for figuring out how we want this to look at each practice level. So if you are vaccinating the school-based health center, sort of how do you intend to roll that out? Are you pre-scheduling appointments? All the sort of planning that needs to happen in advance of that day uh, where we actually vaccinate. Next slide. A little bit about the vaccine. 
I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. The pediatric formulation is a different vaccine. So it's the same sort of formula, the same recipe, if you will. It is only 10 micrograms of mRNA though, rather than 30 micrograms. So a third of the adult dosage. Um, it, it's pretty similar to the adult vaccine, but there are some real key differences. This one has different storage and handling characteristics, which is really beneficial, particularly when it comes to clinics like school-based health centers. So this one can be stored in the refrigerator for up to 10 weeks. That's a really key change. It's gonna allow us to, uh, to distribute it to a lot more clinics than we're able to distribute the original Pfizer vaccine to. So that 10 weeks storage and handling at refrigerated temperatures, that's probably the biggest thing to highlight here. Um, you know, it, it also has a slightly shortened expiration date. It can be stored in an ultra cold freezer for up to six months. Initially, we really expect to be using the vaccine that we distribute within three weeks. So our current plan is to send clinics about a three week supply of vaccine. That way we can use up that initial 120,000 dose group and then start moving on to sort of routine weekly ordering with CDC. Next slide. see a question in the chat. How long is the vial good once punctured? I don't recall right off the top of my head. I think right now um, it's, I believe, six hours. And so it is going to be an, a use up by the end of the clinic day type situation. I can get the exact fact sheet for you on the drug and send it to the school-based health center folks to distribute though. But that's a good question. Um, it, it is not going to be a 28-day multi-dose vial usage like some pediatric vaccines we know. So it's definitely going to be used up by the end of the clinic day. So one of the big takeaways from today's discussion, um, we really need all of you that intend to vaccinate to request doses as soon as possible. So we really are in the process of submitting orders to CDC. I believe the first batch of orders is getting submitted today. So the 20th is the first day. There is sort of a, um, an ordering and shipment timeline I'll go over, but right now there's two ways to request doses. Um, we want clinics to use data to determine how many doses they expect to use in a three-month period. And so um, there are ways to do that using Alert IAS, looking at your prior flu season administration, for instance. If you vaccinate for flu, you can use your EHR to determine how many, how many students or how many patients you serve. But sort of anticipate that three-month supply and see if you can anticipate maybe a one-week or three-week supply as well. If you look like that supply is gonna be 300 or more doses, which I know that probably does not apply to very many school-based cell centers, then use alert to place that three-month request. If not, then there's a survey here. You can place the, your three-month request in that survey. Um, and then, so if that's if you need fewer than 300 doses. If the dose number is more than 300, then it'll ship directly from CDC. And if it's 300 or fewer, then it'll go through one of our regional hubs. And so we have uh, hospitals that have been shipping out COVID vaccine. They get a larger shipment. They break it down to small shipments. So they'll be doing the distribution for 300 doses or fewer. The slides are available to be shared and uh, we are working on parent guardian education materials as well. So I know that's gonna be a really key thing, particularly since this group is not, uh, most of them are not able to consent to vaccination themselves. So yeah, we'll work on parent guardian education materials as well. Next slide. So timelines for delivery, we're really working on placing those initial orders and CDC has structured it in three different waves. So orders placed October and 20th and 21st are expected for delivery November 1st and 2nd. October 22nd and 23rd expected for delivery November 3rd and 4th. And the 24th and 25th are expected for uh, November 5th and 6th delivery. And so we really hope to have some vaccine to all vaccinating sites by November 6th. Um, though we do anticipate probably starting vaccination that week prior to 11-8, that week of 11 8th is going to be a, a really big administration kind of kickoff date for Oregon. It's the first full week that we'll be administering vaccines. So if it gets authorized fully over the weekend, we don't expect to give as many doses, you know, Saturday and Sunday as sort of the beginning of the next week. And so the goal really is to get as much vaccine on site as possible before that sort of kickoff date of 11 8. Um, as I said before, those shipments of 300 more doses, they'll be sent directly to providers less than 300 will be sent through those hospital hubs. Uh, and the vaccine will be stored in folks' refrigerators for 10 weeks. So 
I, I believe we worked with all the school-based health centers and the school-based health center program to make sure you all had sort of adequate storage and handling equipment. Um, I, I think we still have some funding though to help with storage and handling equipment purchase needs and I can send information if folks are interested for that. Next slide. So I guess one of the key questions I really want to talk about today is what is your role in the five to 12 year old vaccination rollout? I know that three quarters of school-based health centers are signed up as pandemic providers. I know that there are a lot of um, issues with parents and there's political issues surrounding this. So I don't wanna sort of oversimplify it. It is a very complex issue, but I really want everybody to sort of think about what their role is in the coming weeks how they can be part of the, the system, whether it's working with the school district. Um, I know there are a lot of school located vaccine clinics that are not being run by school-based health centers. So how can you all be part of that? Um, or whether it's just distributing parent education materials. So even if you're not a vaccinator, when we roll those parent education materials out, how can you help to distribute those? Can you send kids who come into your clinic uh, home with those materials so that parents get a chance to review those? So. What role do you have planned already? And, and how could you maybe expand that role as a really trusted communicator to these parents and these kids? Next slide. So shifting track a little bit, um, you know, COVID has a really, has had a very significant impact on routine immunizations. And so we've been tracking that impact on routine immunizations for, since the beginning of the pandemic, basically. But I think that just to sort of frame it, there's been a reduction of more than 10,000 doses from 2019 to 2020 for critical immunizations. Vaccination rates across all ages have dropped significantly. And so um, I've included a link to a little Tableau visualization that sort of has a bunch of data for you to look at. Um, and then I, I think over the next couple of slides, I just wanna talk about a couple of basic immunizations and that sort of demonstrate this trend so next slide. So the first one, it may be hard to see this. This is adolescent Tdap administration numbers. Um, and so you can see the difference in 2019 to 2020 and then 2019 to 2021. Basically, um, if you see those blue, the blue, red, and green bars in the middle of there, that's the number of doses that were given each month of Tdap to adolescents. And so you can see there was a significant drop off uh, from 2019 to 2020. It really didn't rebound in early 2021. So we, we still had a lot of drop off. There have been a couple months, particularly as childhood immunizations, uh, or sorry, as schools reopened and the school required immunizations sort of rebounded a bit. So you can see um, in March and April, we saw a rebound of those adolescent immunizations but still we're far below what we would, have, would hope to be based on our 2019 data. And so I think school-based health centers have a really big role in sort of catching those kids that slip through the cracks. Um, right now, primary care offices are obviously struggling to get kids in for well-child appointments. And so I'm not sure if any of you have projects to do either reminder recall or other projects to sort of recommend immunizations as you bring kids in for standard care particularly focused on these adolescent immunizations that many of you give. I can send some additional uh, materials on how to run reminder recall in the IAS if it's helpful, but we really have to get these kids caught up and not just sort of for school exclusion purposes, which I know many of you are really involved in school exclusion, but also because it's, it's difficult, particularly with adolescents, to get them back in once they sort of miss those immunization opportunities. Next slide. Oh, just to talk a little bit about the adolescent immunizations, Tdap numbers are really indicative and I use them because they're school required, but uh, they also look very similar for HPV. So there's, there's not a big difference between what happened with Tdap and what happened with HPV or other adolescent vaccines uh, like meningococcal. So the Tdap really kind of just show the trend. This is really an issue where kids just had fewer visits. So the magnitude of the, the drop was less serious for non sort of school required vaccines. You can see with this infant DTAP immunization metric, the drop was not as big as it was for the adolescent vaccines, but it was still significant. And it's had less rebound, I think is another important thing. So 2021 is looking to be um, even behind 2020 as far as vaccines administered at this point. And there really isn't any sign of rebounding. We hope that as you know, 
infant COVID vaccination begins, and as we see more back, more COVID vaccines licensed, that people start to kind of take their kids back to the doctor, get more of those vaccines, but we're also running behind here. And I know school-based health centers don't have nearly the reach in this younger infant population, um, but some of you do serve these folks. And so just remember, as you see them to look up immunization rates in the immunization records in the IAS and recommend vaccines whenever you can. Next slide. So I think this is the second key question I have. The first, of course, was what role do you have in that five to 12 year old COVID vaccine rollout? And then also what role can school-based health centers play in helping to reach kids who've fallen behind on routine immunizations? So we know that not all school-based health centers are a large routine immunization provider, but the kids that you do reach are really a critical population. They're kids that may not be reached through other mechanisms. And so just kind of like to leave you all with that question of what role could you play in reaching those kids who have fallen behind, who might have slipped through the cracks, and how can you integrate that into your sort of standard clinical practice? That's it for me. Do we want to do questions now, or do you want me to stick around for the Q&A? Are you able to stick around, Rex? I am able to. Okay, stick. that would be great. Um, I just want to make sure we have time for the Oregon School Based Health Alliance to present. So I'll just move us forward, and then I know our Q&A session will get <laughs> cut down a little bit. But if people want to also um, put questions for Rex into the chat, you can monitor that um, as he's sticking around. And then we also have the Q&A session. So um, Maureen, I will turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Maureen from the Oregon School-Based Health Alliance. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we're just going to dive right in here. Um, wanted to remind you of our team members and then also note that there is a brand new team member, the amazing Hati Babala, um, our youth programs manager. I don't know if you knew Ashley before, but she went on to pursue a master's in social work. So she's doing great things in other places. Um, and these are our team members. Um, so welcome to Patty. And I also want to mention that this year we've started what we're calling the OSDHA Youth Corps. And so we have four youth interns that are working with us who I didn't have any pictures of yet, but um, they're helping with a number of activities that we're working on. Um, next slide. I wanted to talk about national policy. Um, if you remember a while back, um, we were able to get we, uh, our national uh, advocacy, which includes affiliates like ours and other states and our national organization. We're able to get $5 million for FQHC sponsored SBHCs, which was a, a tiny foot in the door. Unfortunately, um, no Oregon SBHCs received those awards, but the advocacy has continued. And so um, right now there's a, a a budget bill in the House that has $50 million for SBHCs. That's $25 million for FQHC sponsored FQHCs and $25 million for non FQHC sponsored FQHCs. When I made this slide, we were still advocating for $100 million in Senate appropriations. What ended up happening is there's $60 million, so another split 30 FQHC, 30 million non FQHC. So what happens next is there's a reconciliation process, but it's the odds are pretty good that the number will be between 50 and 60 million. Um, so they're pretty close and that's, that's a good deal. Um, the issue is whether or not Congress will function. So <laughs> I think even like the most seasoned lobbyists at this point don't know what's gonna happen with Congress, but if they move forward and function, there will probably be more SBHC grants and um, they will, HRSA is wanting to prioritize those who applied last time. Um, at least that's what they've said so far. And so if you applied last time, there's a pretty good shot that you might be able to get some of that federal funding. And if you didn't, there's another, there might be another chance. Um, again, when and how, I don't know. Uh, next slide. As you know, our, our, I just wanted to do a, a review of the bills I presented in the last 
um, meeting HB 2591 passed. So that's all of the stuff that everyone was talking about early in the meeting. Um, the trauma-informed schools bill that um, the Oregon Hispanic Advocacy Commission um, picked up that we were supporting did not pass, unfortunately. Um, but I did want to put out there that uh, if you have wants or needs for the next upcoming session in February to let us know, it, it's a short one month session. I think it's going to be focused on COVID relief and housing and things like that. So um, right now we're not planning to put a bill in, but if there's a need that is really coming up that is um, that is something you intensely need, please let us know. It's definitely not too late to be planning for that. Um, and my email's right there, so you can just email me directly or call me or whatever. Um, next slide. We are planning our advocacy day again. That's one of the things that the youth interns are helping with. Um, so we're planning it to be February 10th. And it will be virtual again, like it was last year. Um, we will do the advanced training videos uh, like we did last year and work on scheduling meetings with your legislators. So um, if you could plan for that, if, you, if you're working with YACS this year, let them know. I think, it, I think it was still fun, even though it was virtual last year. And in fact, some people from further reaches of the state were able to participate that never were before. So that was pretty cool. Um, and Mikea is going to be taking the lead on Advocacy Day. Uh, next slide. We have some different opportunities coming up that I kind of crammed into one slide here. On October 28th, um, we will have a lunch and learn that uh, last, last spring, um, we had a youth uh, advocacy conference. Or it was kind of a, a caucus space where youth of color and LGBTQ youth were able to discuss some of their, some of their barriers to SBHC utilization. And they had some good things to say too. Um, and so that will be presented by Mikea on the 28th from 12 to 1. There is a very small sliding scale type fee, but youth and people of color can attend for free. Um, and I just wanted to note that that fee is really helping to support some of the youth work that we do that is unfunded. Um, so that's why that's there, but it's tiny. Um, We'll also be doing an LGBTQ plus training for school health professionals broadly. Um, and that will be available later this year and we'll, we'll do it twice. And what that is going to focus on is how to better support LGBTQ plus youth, create safer spaces. Um, and that will be part one. And then there will be a part two that is about supporting um, youth and families with family acceptance and talking about confidentiality and HIPAA and FERPA and those things that go along um, with that. And we are partnering with GLSEN Oregon to do that training. And then we have some funding from the Knight Cancer Institute to do HPV peer education. And um, we are already working with a few different schools, but we have we need one more volunteer, um, ideally in a rural location. So if you're interested in that, let me know. It, it involves, we have youth that provide the education in the school. So your role is really just to coordinate with the school and then provide data to see if HPV vaccinations increase in your clinic. Um, so again, let me know if you're interested in that opportunity. And then last but not least, oh, real quick, I put the um, registration, oh, Jen just put it in there. Thank you, Jen, um, for the lunch and learn in the chat. Um, so last but not least, we have um, some additional funding to increase your capacity for COVID-19 vaccination events. I know that 
capacity is really limited, that you're strained, that you might not have <laughs> very much staffing. And um, we hope that a little bit of funding might help in some way. Um, last time the funding was just mini grants, like 2,500 up to 7,500, depending on if you were doing the event or if you just wanted funding for outreach, if you were partnering. Um, and so we're hoping to get a little more information about what would be helpful this round. Um, and I also wanna mention a couple uh, like partnership opportunities. If you don't have the capacity, Medical Teams International has been funded by Kaiser. This is all from Kaiser as well, all over the state. It's not just in the Kaiser footprint. They're going statewide with this. Um, and they are able to set up and provide vaccine events. And so if you want to do an event, but it's too controversial at, at your school, for example, you don't wanna hold it at the school, MTI can come and do it at a different location. And it won't necessarily be like the SPHC doing it, but there will be opportunities for, um, for events to happen. They set it up, they enter into alert, they you know count the people that are served they do uh, they can do all of that for you so that is a way to increase your capacity and if you're in the metro more the metro area then um, we have uh, potentially the same opportunity with project access now so um so i have a poll which kong was kind enough to enter in and if you could put that poll up kong that would be great just so we can get a little more information about what you all are thinking. Take a few minutes to answer those. And if this poll doesn't cover your thoughts, please feel free to enter into the chat. And of course, I'll be here for the Q&A at the end as well. Um, well, and I don't know if you can see how many people have answered or not, so I'm not quite sure how to, how to close it, when to close it down, but if you have a, a sense, then feel free to close it down when you're ready or when it Seems like people are ready. Um, people are still answering. I'll give it like maybe 10 more seconds. Um, and we're going to be releasing this funding opportunity like as soon as possible in the next week or two, because um, we know uh, your events, you're probably already planning them, they're around the corner, the uh, approval is around the corner, and so we want to provide support as quickly as possible. Okay, that sounds good. So if you, again, if you have other thoughts, um, please put them in the chat or get in touch. You can contact me. Um, Jen Shin is taking the lead on this, but you can contact either of us. Um, and we'll get you taken care of. Um, next slide, please. Okay. I wanted to bring up base camp again. We do have a base camp. Um, I would say maybe something like 40 people are signed up. Um, it is an opportunity since we don't get to meet in person anymore for you to network and throw out questions like, you know, how are you handling your events? How are you handling the um, political um, issues that are going on with them? Or um, how are you getting your utilization back up? Or whatever is coming up for you um, can be talked about here. So we are going to 
um, keep plugging away with Basecamp and um, for a little while longer and see if it's helpful for you. Um, so if you want to get signed up, there's the email. Um, but I would strongly encourage you to because I have found this so useful at a national level to be able to talk with our partners there um, and talk about all the issues that are pretty similar across our organizations. Next slide. Another poll. Um, we just want to know so much. Um, as some of you may remember, OSPHA used to put on an in-person conference every year. We haven't done that for a number of years, um, even before COVID, because of capacity, but we are considering doing it again next year. We are hoping that a whole year from now, <laughs> it will be safe to do that. Um, so we want to know what your interest is. Um, um, what kind of in-person conference topics would be? I mean, we typically have like a track that's clinical, a track that's more policy oriented, a youth track, um, there may be administrative tracks. So that's something that we're interested in hearing from people um, about what they're interested in. So here's a poll. Um, so you can help us get a sense of that information as well. All right, we can probably wrap it up. Okay. All right, thanks for thanks for providing that information. That's really helpful. It's looking like um, fairly fairly positive response to the idea of a conference. So that's exciting. Um, we'll talk about it with our team and let you all know. Um, next slide. Membership. Um, it's that time again. Uh, we'll probably be sending out membership invoices soon. Um, just want to reiterate that the membership dollars are what help support our advocacy work. That's in some of our youth work um, that can't be funded by grants and things like that from folks who who don't want to support lobbying for political purposes. So um, that's that's how we get that work done, um, and it's a really important contribution to our field. Um, and we really appreciate all of your support. So next slide. That's all that we have. Um, if you want to get in touch, you can email me or find our the other folks' information. All of our names are just our first name at osbha.org. Um, and then we have these other ways to keep in touch as well. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left of the meeting, and I do want to open it up for people that might have questions. And Kwong, you could probably take off the slideshow. Um, and if people have any questions for the presenters, so I know Rex and Joe and 
the Alliance, Marines here, um, anything from us at the state program office, and then questions for the field. Um, you all, is there anything that, that you're curious about, what other people are experiencing, anything that you feel like you can use some peer support on? Um, I encourage you to type it into the chat or unmute yourself. I do see a question in the chat, um, Maureen, what kind of in-person conference topics would there be? Yeah, that would be driven by you all. So we'll, we'll look at the poll answers and as far as the initial kind of scope. And then we often will um, either send out information or we um, pull together a, kind of a steering committee that helps us decide some of the topics. Um, you know, everyone's really busy this year, so we would try to do something as efficiently as possible, but we try to mine that information from you. Great. Yeah, I think I think there are a lot of people here in the Aquarius meeting that haven't been around mm -hmm. for um, the conferences, so um, I'm sure folks are really curious. I, I think they're fabulous. I miss them. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Uh, I think when, she, oh, go ahead. When are we to expect the satisfaction survey to come our way for this school year? Yeah, due to um, programming um, staffing shortages, we have not been able to get um, our programmers to develop the survey yet. So we're anticipating it'll be after the first of the year. We're hoping very soon, early um, January. Um, I'd sent out that announcement buried in a whole lot of other bullets, um, previous emails. But yeah, when I send out the OP um, email, with reminders, I'm also going to include that to make sure that information gets out far and wide. So sorry for the delay. Um, we're we're doing the best that we can to um, get that out. Sure. So and then will will the numbers be the same then? They're going to be yeah. They're going to be similar to how they were this last year, where um, they're much lower than they typically have been. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so that will be. Um, That'll be easier, especially with a shorter time period for administering the survey. Yes, thank you. Sure, of course. Um, so I yeah. have a couple questions and comments. I started to type them into the chat, but my first one, just for other school-based health center providers and um, administrators, I feel like I, we're in Grants Pass, Oregon, and this is our fourth school year being in the in the schools. Um, and I feel like we're always kind of trying to like tiptoe around making sure that we are not upsetting people that are on the school board <laughs> because they've had to give us, you know, their blessing to even be on campus. So when I hear, you know, from Maureen, I'm really interested in a lot of, you know, getting these you know, youth advocacy programs or groups together and, and get really inspired about trying to reach out to the student body about forming some of these on campus. And then my next reaction is, oh no, like who's gonna get upset by what? And so I'm just looking for some, maybe some insight in, into how to balance those two things between the powers that allow us to be here and then us doing what's best for the student body as a whole. Welcome to school-based health centers. Yes. <laughs> so that was my first thing. And then my next thing, I just wanted to just give out an FYI. I don't know if anyone else has ran into this. I tried to call the Oregon, like that main kind of hotline phone number to make a CPS report yesterday. I sat on hold for like 45 minutes to an hour on three different occasions because I had to keep hanging up um, to go tend to students and then come back and try again. So I just wanted just putting that out there that there's appears to be a very big backlog and a staffing shortage for manning that hotline. Shauna, if I, I, I were experiencing the same thing and it's um, kind of a good sign but it, it's also not very helpful for the people making the calls. I think, I, and somebody can correct me if I'm off here, but I believe that they 
turned it into a centralized numbers because the you know rural communities didn't have a direct line to call to and so they're busy because more people were making calls including those rural areas where it wasn't happening before but now it's like we're so backlogged um i know that the feedback has been given to dhs they're aware of it and all that kind of stuff but yeah we're even experiencing that here where we've had um in Clackamas County, where we've had tons of engagement with DHS, never had the problem before, and it's been going on. Yeah, no, and this was new. I'm used to a little bit of a wait, of course. Um, no, it's ridiculous was, these days. beyond what I'm used to, and I still haven't actually been able to make the report because I'm a mm -hmm. clinician and I have to go see, I can't sit on hold for four hours. So I was just letting everyone know that that is, is going on. Um, and that is that 24 seven hotline number for Andrea who just commented, that is the wait um, for that hotline. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if anyone had any feedback about how to kind of balance the struggles between the board and teachers and making, trying to keep everyone, maybe not happy, but at least <laughs> home, that would be great. <laughs> hey, Shanna, this is Tamara Harris with Mosaic Medical. If you want to reach out to me directly, I can share some about that. You know, we have um, basically six school-based health centers, and we're hoping to have more in three different counties, and we've really leveraged those relationships over the last, you know, nine to ten years. So I don't want to take up time here, but we can talk. Yeah, that sounds great, because we are, are, the clinic that we are through, we are now in a handful of schools and just opened another one in another county school versus the city district. So um, I will definitely be emailing you. Thank you. Such great information. And um, Lori, I think you wrote in the chat, you'd love to see a professional presentation by the state at a school board meeting. I think we, we have presented at school board meetings. We're happy to present at school board meetings. We've been down on our capacity, um, but it, it definitely is something that we are, we are absolutely willing to do. So um, it's not always the best to have the state there. I will just say that. So it can go either way, but um, if you want to reach out, if anyone feels like they need that, it's it's mostly just been a capacity issue on our team, but we're happy to do that. We're also happy to provide talking points or slides slides to help someone else support the presentation if you feel like it's not always best that state person's representing. Um, and and similarly, the alliance might might be able to support those asks also. Um, That's what I was going to add. We're also happy to happy to support. Um, Rex, there was a quick question in the chat about the difference of emergency authorization versus regular use authorization. Yeah, so EUA was a process that was created to sort of streamline uh, biologicals after 9-11. And it really, it, it still involves sort of presenting full safety data, but it does allow the presentation of interim trial data. And so whenever they have a clinical trial for a drug, they basically, basically, in advance of the trial, they declare what their endpoints are and their follow-up time. And those follow-up times can stretch to be six months, nine months, depending on the drug. With uh, childhood vaccines, I think right now they're using a six-month follow-up time. And so they have to sort of track all the participants in the trial for that full time. And so for EUA, they don't have to have, they don't have to have completed all of the follow-up time. In particular with vaccines, they can complete sort of a truncated follow-up time that includes the vast majority of potential adverse reactions. And so they still have to go back and submit the rest of that trial data to get full authorization, but allows them to sort of bring that vaccine to the market, uh, particularly with the continued risk of COVID. That's a really important thing because these trials can, can last for quite some time. So it just means that uh, they've completed a full trial um, for that initial safety review, and then they still have some follow-up data to submit to FDA. And that's basically the biggest difference. Um, so I'm going to close the meeting just by um, thanking everyone so much for taking the time today. It was a lot of information. Um, please feel free to follow up with us to get contacted with the presenters. 
or contact the presenters themselves. Everyone's shared information. I know everyone's really busy. And so we can also help make connections between school-based health centers. And, and now that we have more capacity on the team, um, we've been talking a lot about trying to create some more spaces for you all to have more opportunity to talk and share. And so questions like the school board pieces were more than, um, it's a one-on-one -on -one connection, but maybe the group can share. Um, thank you, everyone. Please um, take care of yourselves and please feel free to reach out to us and let us know how we can help and support you. And I hope everyone has a good day. The sun finally came out here. I don't know about the rest of the state, but it was a gloomy morning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rosalind. Bye, everybody. Good to see everybody. Bye. Bye.